thank you very much for being with us for that interview. Pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, and I guess you must be very, very happy about the launch of uh, your whiskey uh, from the Waterford Distillery. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we've been we've been bowled over, bowled over by the the reception. Uh, I'm very, very pleased. Yes, it's uh, very heartening. Yeah, the, your distributor said uh, it was the most successful launch they have ever seen. So, yes, we've, uh, in fact, all our all our distributors said the same thing. Right. I I, I think what it shows is is that there's um, there's a thirst for wanting to know more. Mm. And so everything we've been working on, I think, uh, you know, people have you know, poo pooed it and they've mocked it and they've, they've joked about it. But the reality is the consumer who we've all, you know, we have all educated into whiskey over the last 20, mm. 30 years. And well, they want to know more. Uh, um, and, you know, giving, the, the, you know, telling people how it really is. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, the fundamental thing about barley, you know, I, I still find this really funny, that, that what makes single malt whiskey whiskey, its legal definition you know, is it has to be made from barley. Right. That's where all the flavor is. Mm -hmm. There's only, wa only water, yeast and barley. So, so you know, it's, it's not rocket science. And yet, and yet... Nobody wants to talk about the barley. I find this absolutely astonishing. You know, it's the major ingredient. It's where the flavor is. Yeah. And yet, oh, no, 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 see no evil. Oh, no, don't want to know. Um, so that's what I find uh, astonishing. And I think, I think the consumer out there, uh, the wine drinker, understands what we're doing, that the whiskey drinker, well, you know, isn't a fool. Um, tell me about it. So we are. And so I think that it's, it's fallen on very fertile soil. Mm. I, I've heard the story that it was Duncan McGillivray that brought you over to, to Ireland in some way by talking about the barley there. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I, w w w w as you know, I, I, I was in the wine trade for half my career. Mm. 220, um, I've been in the drinks industry for 40 years. So I've gone from the wine side, from growing wine to bottling wine, labeling wine, shipping wine, retailing wine, to retailing whiskey, shipping whiskey, bottling whiskey, growing barley, distilling it. So, so I, I, I see both sides of the, uh, um, of, of, the, of the industry. So I think I'm in a quite a unique place. And I realized in, in, in around about 95, uh, the early 90s that, that with, with this sort of uh, sort of renaissance of single malt whiskey in fact renaissance is not the right word this naissance of single malt whiskey um, and you're looking at how it was done and thinking well you know, I'm sure I can do this better myself um, which is how I set out to buy Brook Laddie which took a long time it took almost a decade um, and then with Brook Laddie, um, I met Duncan McGilvery, who was the engineer at Brook Laddie, had been since the 60s. And one of those people in your life you come across uh, that you never forget. Mm. Very quiet man, uh, very, very, very softly spoken. Um, but one of those people that I just, you, you, you just click. I just, I just, you know, really gone on with him. And of course, he uh, was tasked with getting all the old Brookladdy machinery going again, and of course, keeping it going. Um, and so, when I got talking to him about barley and my ideas for barley, which was, you know, it says Scotch whiskey on the label, so it ought to be Scottish barley. Um, and really, you know, we ought to try and grow it on Isla. And of course, none had been grown on Isla for a you know, since the First World War. So, you know, everyone forgot how to do it. Um, the climate's quite difficult. You know, we're, we're quite a way up north. Uh, the growing season is very short uh, because of the autumn gales and the spring storms, you know, which means getting on the ground is very difficult with machinery. But then we make up for it with very long daylight. Mm. 
anyhow, so so Duncan helped. You know, we talked about barley. We persuaded a few farmers to grow barley again, and we started uh, uh, distilling them. And but my theory was that you know different soils. This comes from the wine uh, background. Different soils, different microclimates. This concept of terroir, which seems to frighten some people, is being rather sophisticated and mysterious. But really, it's just grown-up gardening. Uh, um, you, you know, the, 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 how, the, how the microclimate, the soil, the bedrock, which gives you the soil, uh, um, the, the altitude and drainage and topography, all these things influence how that plant grows. And we all know it with a vine. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you know, the medieval monks watched it happening. And, you know, the, the, the Appalachian Controle system enshrined it in law uh, um you know the funny thing was you know every, everybody in the continent understands terroir but for some reason this side of the channel we seem to have forgotten about it um so um i wanted to introduce that concept to growing barley and my theory was that it ought to if, if barley is where all the flavor is well, then how it grows and where it grows should have some impact on it. It goes to reason. And, and I, I knew this was right, and I, I, um, I, I'd proven it. Uh, when uh, the first Christmas of growing Isla Bali, and we invited all the farmers down, there was about 10 of them. We got a photograph of it somewhere. And we gave each farmer... Um, a little sample of his own spirit, spirit distilled from his own. And it was just so wonderful to watch these farmers, who are, are never very talkative at the best of times, starting to sort of argue with each other about whose was better. Uh, um, and then it, you, you, you'd overhear them saying, well, yeah, but, you know, we, 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 we are neighbours, and we, I saw you, you know, sowing your seed the same day I did mine, and you know, we harvested, we shared a combine harvester. And, you know, how come yours is different to mine? Mm. Um, and, of course, rationalizing by saying, well, actually, yours is sandier because you're nearer the sea, whereas I've got more peat in mine. And that must be the reason. So, so this, this was you know, the, 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 the interest that, that surely there was something here we could do with growing barley. Um, but, of course, on Isla, the climate's difficult. Um, the, the, there's not much, as you know, there's not much arable ground available. In fact, it wasn't long before we used up all the available uh, spare ground. Um, and, uh, but we never had the logistics that's the problem. We never had the logistics to do it properly. And we didn't have the, the will of my colleagues. They sort of thought it was all a bit puffy and a bit sort of, you know, southern and a bit sophisticated and a bit, you know, not traditional and, you know, will be laughed at. And, uh, um, you know, that, that, that I was barking up the wrong tree. And so, so, so there's a whole lot. And plus, we couldn't afford it. So, mm. so we couldn't do it properly. But, uh, you know, I remember sitting with Duncan and him saying one summer's evening that the best barley he'd ever seen in the, well, uh, by then, 40 years he'd worked at Brooklady came from Ireland and coincidentally from the port of Waterford. But that's coincidence. (laughs) Uh, um, And I remember this, the best barley he'd ever seen. Um... So when Remy Quantro bought Brookladdy, and I still felt that I had you know, unfinished business to attend to, um, so I was quite frustrated by that. Um, so I thought, well, you know, I need to do this properly. Um, and I looked around Scotland for something that interested me, but I couldn't find anything. Um, so I thought, well, what about Ireland? I can see it from Isla, not far away. Um, so best barley, I followed the barley, thanks to Duncan. I followed the barley. Um, obviously seven or eight years ago, there wasn't a great deal going on in Ireland. 
Um, so that was quite interesting. You know, a bit of a blank sheet of paper. Um, and then the third part of the uh, um, project was was somewhere to do it. Um, and it coincided with you know, it's one of those little things you read in the press and you go, you know, Diageo creating a super brewery in Dublin and, you know, closing down you know, the other brewery. And, and of course, it just stays in the back of your mind while they're closing down the brewery. Brewing is, you know, two thirds of distilling. Well, I wonder. Um, so I went to see this Guinness brewery in the port of uh, Waterford on the southern coast of Ireland. And there was, you see it the moment you arrive on the train, this whopping great big uh, brewery on the River Shure, uh, which is actually a, an, an estuary at that point. Um, and, you know, of course, inside was this Aladdin's cave of equipment, the likes of which you've never seen in a distillery before. And remember, I came from Brooklady, you know, Victorian mm. distillery, you know, wonderful yes. cast iron stuff, which I just adored, you know. And this was the antithesis, complete opposite. This was more stainless steel than you could shake a stick at. Um, you know, ooh, bling, bling, bling. And you think, well, actually, you know what? This is... You know, wh wh who's going to use this? You know, it, it, uh, um, it won't ever be used again as a brewery because Diageo will, you know, had said it couldn't be. Um, not much, uh, you know, use for it. So uh, um, I was able to buy it relatively cheaply, bearing in mind it had only been built 10 years earlier in 2004. Um and shut down in 2014. So, so you, know, you know, 40 million euros of state-of-the-art brewing kit. Like well, what, you, right? Well, well yeah, and it's yeah. amazing. You know, uh, uh, that, it, now, you know, it's important, you know, it's, it, this is no Brooklady. It doesn't have that intimacy, that uh, Hebridean beauty, the romance. No, 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 no. This is a Formula One race car. You know, this is mm. a thoroughbred. Uh, um, you don't fall in love with it. You're in awe of it. And that, you know, let me make that plain. You know, this is humming. This is, you know, uh, poetry. Um, so the first thing we had to do was introduce the copper, which is the, the stilling bit. And funnily enough, when Waterford was being built in 2004, we were raiding in the Leven distillery in, on the River Clyde at mm. Dumbarton um, and removing the stills that had been used there intermittently since 1974 to make uh, a pure single malt. Uh, um, that was used by um, Heron Walker. And so this sort of unknown hidden distillery, fun enough, it's a it was a vertically integrated distillery. You know, most distilleries are horizontal. This was mm -hmm. actually shoehorned in between lots of other buildings. It was built vertically. Um, we'd been tipped off by uh, um, a wonderful demolition guy who'd been charged with blowing it all up, knocking it down. And he said, look, if you get in there quickly, you can take what you want. So we did. Um, and we ran Brook Laddie, Duncan McGilvery. We ran um, the distillery, spare parts on you know, lots of bits we, we raided uh, at that time. Um, but of course, the two or three stills one of them, we used um, Ugly Betty. Um, it's a Lohman still, uh, mm -hmm. uh, experimental Lohman still, the first one we used uh, to make some gin. But the two, the spirit in the pot still sat outside the distillery. The one down in Port Charlotte and one at Brooklady. Mm -hmm. And that's where they sat. So, so these stills, although they were built in 74 by Blair's, hadn't really been used very much. 
um, that you know they've been used for about 15 years, and then you know it was shut down, and then we shipped them to Isla, and they sat there for another 10 years. Uh, um, so they, they hadn't been used that much. So we were very lucky to be able to uh, ship them, <laughs> having gone from Glasgow to Isla, from Isla to Waterford, via Forsyth, who refurbished them for us. And so very quickly, we were able to convert this Rolls-Royce into a distillery. Um, in fact, it took us one year and one day before we were distilling. Um, and during that period, this was 2015, the important uh, um, provisioning was put in place, the logistics. This is what makes it all work. Um, because I wanted to uh, grow barley on different farms, which means it's got to be stored because, as you know, the harvest, barley harvest is a two-week mm -hmm. window. So um, we wanted to make a, a million liters of alcohol. That was our sort of token goalpost, which would mean we need to buy 5,000 tons of barley off the field where are you going to put it and more importantly how are you going to keep it separate so you know that this came from that farm that came from that farm when you've got three trailer loads of barley winging their way from each farm 40 farms you know in a two-week window sure. you can imagine it's it's, it's a, a you know so with the dalton brothers who um liked our project who liked the idea they built us a bespoke um, entrepot, um, warehouse, not the right word, entrepot, um, designed to store 130, 140 tons of barley per farm in their own concrete bins with air underneath and um, delivery mechanism above mm -hmm. with a dryer, a dedicated Alvin Blanche dryer. So this meant, this is a game changer. So this means that we can harvest one farm during the day. We can um, dry it overnight and we can store it by morning in perfect condition. Right. Each of 40, 40 farms, one, one bin per farm. And that buys us the, the breathing space. We call it the cathedral because it's glorious. It's absolutely glorious. Wonderful, uh, cavernous place. So, so it, was, it was very lucky that the malting company, because there's not much space in Ireland, equally were intrigued by my proposition. And they agreed to help me do it. Um, they had a, series, uh, a team of agronomists, um they had they obviously knew um, all the good farmers in the region that might be up for it um and more importantly squirreled away in their huge malting location at, at athai uh, south west of dublin um they had um a small 90 ton uh, um, maltings built by Vickers um, Bobby it's called a, it's called a Bobby uh, mm. malt um, and they shut down but they had it there um, and so they renovated that so we had the dedicated use of this small maltings and you know people ask about you know what why is it you know uh, 130 tons well this malting operates on 90 tons of barley so 90 tons obviously isn't 130 no but we lose a lot so so when when the barley is off the field depending on the yield um there's a lot of um, um uh, dust and roots and bits and pieces which sure. um, screenings they're called which yeah. go and of course we dry it so that dries it down to 90 tons. So the 90 tons goes into the two 
different parts of the malting and will deliver to the distillery 75 tons of malted barley. So we lose almost half uh, uh, um, before we've even started. Um, so we, we, we then uh, call on that barley. One farm a week takes roughly five days to ferment it, five days to distill it. Um, so they overlap. Um, and you know, so we can trace that barley from the field to the storage, to the maltings, to the distillery, to the barrel um, in an unprecedented way. Um, so so th that gives us um, 40 mini Waterford whiskies a year, 200 wow. barrels of each. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not an insignificant, you know, we're doing this, in, you know, it's an artisanal it. approach, but it, it, it's done in a serious scale. Uh, um, so 200 barrels of each, um, same sort of wood policy for each farm, um, so that each farm is in its own right, a standalone, should we wish it, uh, Irish single malt whiskey. Mm. Um, and that's how we've uh, uh, um, laid down this library of component Waterford single malt whiskies, the likes that, that no one's ever seen. Mm. So you know, this, this, this whole project has been done to provide this uh, uh, um, ver variable uh, um, aging uh, profile um, that we can sort of cut lots of different ways. Um, and knowing that everything is what we say it is. Because there's a big problem with doing something like this is that th there's natural cynicism. You know, we've all yeah. worked in the whiskey industry. We've all heard the bullshit. We've all heard the propaganda and the smoke and sure. the mirrors. Partly, you know, ignorance, partly deception, deceit. You know, we've heard it all. Um. And I wanted to make sure this was unimpeachable. So from the ground up, we're not doing anything retrospectively. We did it from the ground up, mm -hmm. right from day one, unprecedented provisioning of barley. So you know, having these single farms or single farm origins, as we call them, um, each one um, a different terroir. Yeah different uh, growing environment how do we prove that to you um you know i can tell you it but i mean you know, that cynicism we you know how why would you why should you believe me so so what we find at waterford is is, is there's this sort of um we have it we call it the the waterford equation which is the three t's um we've got a single farm origin a terroir, mm -hmm. but how do we prove it? We have to have the traceability that we can prove that that farm produced that spirit. So we have to be able to dot, join all the dots yeah. up. And having that proof that of, of, of terroir, that traceability, is no good unless we have the transparency to show you. Right. So you can see the dots being joined up. Then we all know that that spirit came from that field. And, and so, so that's what it's all about. The three T's, terroir, traceability and transparency. You sent me, um, your distillery sent me two bottles of Umic, uh from the, um, both the same barley, both the same yeast, I think, and both the same process. And I have to admit, I was a little bit skeptical about um, about terror as well, because uh, I come from advertising, and I have mm. heard so much uh, strange sure. marketing BS, you know. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I tasted them, and I was prepared for a little difference between the two of them, and I was completely overwhelmed how completely different they are. Yeah. It's and fun, isn't it? It's 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 amazing, I, and I still can't explain why. Can you explain yeah, why they are so different? 
Well, it's the tower. That's the yeah. only difference. Because we can prove to you, we can demonstrate to you that these were uh, malted the same. Mm. They were uh, fermented the same, milled, mashed the same, fermented the same, distilled the same. We can prove all that. We've mm. got the data. Thanks to Diageo, we've got data coming out of our ears. Uh, um, because all, all this state-of-the-art machinery has got sensors all over it. I mean, they were intended for efficiency purposes. Mm -hmm. We've just turned it upside down and used it for qualitative purposes. So we can see what's going on. And in the first year or two, we didn't change anything except seasonally. Mm -hmm. So harvest-wise, the first harvest, 215, was all treated the same. The second harvest, 216, was all treated the same. The third harvest, 217, mm, we made some changes in the middle. And then by 218, 219, we were bespoking each farm. Now, partly because we wanted to find out what our machinery did. Mm. Partly because we wanted to make it sure it was uniform and no one could say, oh, well, you're malting, you're doing this different, you're doing that different. Right. So, so, you know, we deliberately kept it the same, meaning we compromised our yields. So it cost us money to do it. Mm. Uh, um, but we wanted to be sure that no one could say, ah, well, of course they're different because you've made them different. Well, no, they are not. And I can prove it. Mm. So, so, you know, this is part of having that data um, the the terroir code on the on the website right. you can see yeah. and and it's, it's only in beta stage at the moment we've got so much stuff information it's trying to work out ways of presenting it that makes sense to people mm. uh, so so it, we'll improve it as as as, as time goes by uh, um, so but so no they are malted the same they are fermented the same distilled the same and they go into the same sort of word I've told you that already. Mm. Uh, um, so, well, in fact, those samples you're talking about haven't been in wood yet. So you are seeing only the barleyness, the right. influence on that barley growing. Uh, and the difference in the two you've seen or nosed is that one of them is a very sandy soil. Right. And the other one is glacial drift. So it's, it's um, silty. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the difference. Uh, we know when they were harvested. We, we, we've got all that information. So, so you are nosing terroir. Right. So you say that's more difference than between different types of, of barley. The terroir has more well, influence on the taste than the type of barley. Yes. Yes. That's something we've discovered um, accidentally um, and a bit of a surprise. Um, because obviously, uh, um, knowing as we do the cynicism of our industry, um, one of the critiques of what we did at Brookladdy when we tried these single farms, you know, despite not having the, as I said, the the, the wherewithal to do it properly, um, was certain people would say, ah, oh, but there's no scientific evidence to prove that terroir exists. And blow me down, they were right. There is, or was, no scientific evidence to prove that terroir exists. I looked, there isn't. The French, the Germans, winemakers, mm. they take it for granted. Sure. They know it exists. The medieval monks knew, it, it, they just didn't give it a name. Um, so nobody bothered to actually prove it scientifically. So I have. Mm. Uh, um, so we did um, with uh, the first definitive terroir proving study with the Ministry of Agriculture in Ireland, um, Dr. Dustin Herb from the University of Oregon, um, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Macaulay, from the Ministry of Agriculture in Ireland, Cork University, with their gas uh, spectrum, uh, mass spectrum gas chromatography um, uh, machinery, 
Um, and Dr. Harry Rifkin, who is Scotland's leading whiskey um, laboratory analyst. And over three years, we've been um, monitoring the same bits of ground and doing the definitive study. Not one year, not two, but three. Just mm. to be sure, just to make sure it's all right. right. And one of the things, and this will be peer-reviewed um, and will be published in the um, International uh, Distillers and Brewers um, uh, Society in the autumn. Um, in fact, COVID was part of a problem. With, you know, it would, we would have released it sooner. You know. mm -hmm. um, anyhow, uh, um, the first thing is I can tell you, I can reassure you that, funnily enough, Tewa does exist and we have the evidence to prove it. So now you know, no one can say that it doesn't exist. It does. But one of the things that was a bit surprising was that the variety of barley was less impactful. And how, how come? Well, why, why, why is this? And of course, when we, when we investigated um, the major barley, and this is sort of symptomatic of mm. the issue um, about how no one takes barley that seriously for flavor. They do for yield, but flavor, less so. Um, and it goes back to the 60s when research was done, commissioned by the big guys, about how to make more barley, greater yields, you know, shorter strength, lengths of straw, mm. Uh, more grain, fatter grain, more disease resistance. It was all about yield. How do we get more per yes. ton? Um, it wasn't how do we get more flavor? So as a consequence, the varieties that were propagated from the 60s um, were never propagated for flavor purposes. And the varieties we use today always improved year by year by year, are just genetically too close together mm. to those ones from the 60s. So if you want varietal change of flavor, you've got to go back to varieties before they started this propagation program. So you've got to go back to before the 60s. So to beer uh, barley and things like that, right? Sure, sure. Mm. So, 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 you know, we're cultivating a variety that was famous in the 50s called Hunter. Uh, we're cultivating, you know, from a, from a museum, five gram, you know, seed samples. We've had to propagate it up, bulk it up. And the same with another one from 1900 called Goldthorpe. And then a sort of Irish equivalent of beer, which is funny, just old Irish which is the sort of indigenous wild variety that used to grow in the Middle Ages. You know, the yields are appalling, um, but that's where you actually get larger flavor differences because they're genetically further apart. Mm. I, I, two more questions on that subject. The first one is a very short one. Have you ever tried to make to bake bread out of the barley you have? And to see if the bread tastes different. We not in Ireland. We did we did beer barley. We, 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 we somebody baked some beer uh, mm. um, bread, and that was delicious. Uh, um, but no, it, 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 it would be it would yes. Why not? We should do that. We should do that. Mm. It, it could be interesting. I mean, it, The, 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 you know, the thing, you know, everybody who works in the distillery, you know, each time we move to a different farm, mm. or each time we move to a different harvest, you can smell the difference, you know, mm. in the distillery. You know, it's, it's, it's. So, so all of this, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's the bleeding obvious. It's not anything yeah. weird or, or, or cranky. It's, it's taking, uh, or, or, Going back to what our forefathers knew all along, if you go back to distilling in the 17th, 18th centuries, when most of it was illegal, it was done by farmers using their own barley. Mm. And if they were any good at it, or they had a good barley supply, 
they would get bigger and then they'd sort of get rid of the cows and put in stills and you know then they'd become little farm distilleries and if they were still good they would right. get bigger and rebuild and and you ended up with Lagavulin and you know Ardbeg and all these these, these distilleries that's the that's the progress but they all originally started mm. um, as, as apart from the the modern you know, Brookladdy and Bunahaven that were purpose built as distilleries um they, you know they started out as 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 you know one man bands and they would use their own barley that they grew themselves some were in better spots for it some had you know uh, 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 better soils some had uh, more protection uh, um you know some were just better at it mm-hmm. so in, in one respect it's going you know it's going back to sort of how you know, how it was was more how it was before it became industrial and you know b- before you know barley just became a commodity to be bought wherever it's the cheapest you know most of it comes the ukraine australia uh, um scandinavia england you know uh, um there's no provenance um and there can never be provenance mm. ah Say to people, you know, some, some, they, ah, but it's about where it's made. It's the, it's the distillery's own way of distilling. Well, I, I can't even believe that because most of them, you know, either belong to Diageo, you know, twenty nine of them, whatever, uh, of a uh, um, you know, history, yes, time, uh, um, sh- still shapes, yes, they evolved between. Uh, you know, sort of 1815, 1881, uh, 1981. You can you can see the evolution, uh, um, you know, the purity of spirit you can make these days compared to um, using old stills. You know, uh, uh, um, I don't know, Lagavulin versus you know Brookladdy, for example. You know, that's that's a still shape. You know, forget mm. the peat thing. You know, you, you, you compare peat with peat. But no, forget the peat. It's 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 the actual sh- still shapes that are d- determining that. So yeah, uh, uh, um, there are idiosyncrasies of still shape. Uh, um, but you know, even even then, uh, uh, philosophies. Okay, well, you know, does Diageo have a different philosophy for each distillery? Sort of doubt it. Uh, um, so so anyhow, so. Uh, uh, mm. um, you know, I, I, I think that how, how it used to be where they were using, you know, barley that had, you know, provenance, mm-hmm. uh, barley that had flavor. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the problem for us these days is that the barley used by everybody has to be approved annually. And the people that do all the research are the Diageo and Perno Ricards basically decide what everybody gets. Mm. Um, and so I think, you know, when you, when you look at it today and you look at that, well, 60s, 70s period um, where, you know, flavor went out the window as far as barley was concerned. And it sort of went out the window as far as barrels were concerned. So actually, I think there's been a lost 40 years uh, where you know, you know, I think we could be so much further ahead um, than we actually are. Mm-hmm. So, if if uh, industry takes your findings about terroir and uh, the flavor in barley serious, there must be some change to whiskey making, don't you think so? Uh, 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 you reckon? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, um, I mean, w- what I would say is. Um, uh, the industry doesn't like being questioned. It doesn't like being uh, um, shown up. Um, and the normal attitude of the, it, 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 the industry is, is to deny everything. Um, one or two small guys will take heart and will um, take a barley focused approach. Um, the big guys will pay lip service. Um, I think you know, this is a prediction. What will happen? It, it happened with wood. If you remember at mm. Brookladdy, we first started using French wood. We were ridiculed by all the talking heads. You, know, you can't do this. It, it's an abomination. You know, blah, blah, blah. 
And of course, now they're all doing it. You know? So I think, you know, you'll get that happening too. Mm. They won't all start talking about Bali, but they'll start focusing the language of Bali. That's what will happen first. The, the language, they'll start using this term terroir and corrupting it. They'll, 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 they'll confuse what terroir is. Mm. Try, they'll try and pretend a distillery has terroir. Well, no, it doesn't. It's the crop that has the terroir, not the distillery. Uh, um, it, 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 they'll, they'll, it will be deliberate and it will be um, accidental. But the word terroir will be completely screwed in the process. Um, there'll be lots of pictures of, of, of barley fields and farmers, just like in the food industry. But you know, and I know, that it has nothing to do with their production. Mm. It's all, as you say, PR bullshit, propaganda bullshit. You'll see them buying farms so that the journalists and, and, and whiskey fans get shown these farms, you know, and, and it all looks lovely and everything. But at the back, it's all been shipped in from Timbuktu, you know. I, I mean, th th this, is, this is what the industry does, you know, it's mm. smoke and mirrors. But some of it, some of it will trickle down. Some of it, or rather the other way around, will trickle up. Mm. Some of it will. Just, but just don't a question. hold your breath. Uh, does it change your wood policy? I mean, if you want to preserve the, the taste of the barley in the whiskey, do you have to take a soft approach to, to, the, to the barrels oh. that you use? Well, I, I, as I said, we do the same approach for every farm. Mm. So every farm goes into, there's 200 barrels per farm, mm -hmm. goes into the same proportions of wood. Now, that's fundamentally um, American oak and French oak, um, fundamentally, okay? So we all know about first fill American oak. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, it's the basic yardstick for 90% of mm -hmm. whiskey maturing. Trouble is, First fill American oak has gone really downhill in quality. Uh, the Americans, not being stupid, are saying, well, why are we giving these barrels, or, you know, sending them off to the Scots, and they're using them and getting use from them? Mm. We should be getting, sending them something that they can't get any use from. So we need to extract whatever's there before we send them over. So now they steam them and okay. you know, with, 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 with steam water. So basically to extract every last bourbon effect from it to bolster their productivity, which means the barrels coming to Scotland are neutral. So, you, you know, you're going to see a lot more paler whiskies around until, you know, E150. Uh, um, so that's not a good thing. So finding, you know, un sort of uh, um, manipulated um, first fill American oak is 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 now the big game. Is you know to get you know first fills that actually are what they say they are, that haven't been completely eviscerated. Um, and then of course we use French oak, which is spicier. It's more toasty, buttered toast, mm. less caramel and vanilla, but more toast, more sophisticated flavor, and more variety of origin too. Uh, um, you know, the, the, the different forests of Trancé, Allier, Vosges, produce slightly different woods, which the wine industry has exploited for a long time, which I know about. Um, so, so judicious use of French oak is necessary because mm. too much can be domineering. Um, and it's not what went into the barrels that's relevant. It's the wood itself. So those, when we use French oak, we steam clean them to remove any trace of wine um, because we want the oak, right. not the wine. Uh, and we go to the best chateaus in France because, funnily enough, they bought the best wood, the best t barrel makers, the best forests. Um, but it has to be used very carefully. We also use virgin French oak. Okay from the forest of Limousin, and we use that for color. So if you use first fill French for spice, virgin French for color, virgin American for color, 
uh, first fill American for roundness. We then use what we call uh, VDN, vin du naturel, which is a, a, an all-encompassing winemaking term for fortified wine. So in other words, you know, sherry, port, right. Madeira, Banyuls, Reed Salt, Moray, you know, the lesser Appalachians that use the same method of winemaking, fortified wine, adding alcohol to stop the fermentation, leaving residual sugar. And okay. what? Those we don't steam because we actually want that sweetness. So VDN is the term. It's what sherry used to do uh, um, you know, before 1988. Sherry barrels were used for that purpose. Uh, sherry was shipped to the UK, as was port, as was Madeira. It was all bottled up in the ports of London and Leeds, Liverpool and uh, uh, um, um, Cork and, and, and Dublin. And the barrels were sent off to distilleries. Um, but that doesn't happen anymore. Everything's bottled at source. Mm. So there are barrels. So, you know, people tell you, oh, we use sherry barrels, sherry barrels. Not really. Prepared ones. You, you, yes. <laughs> they're barrels that might have been made in sherry land. Um, but they're not really what we would call sherry barrels. They're very, very few and far between. But there are other winemaking areas that started to use hogsheads. And so, so, so we, we use those. So we use it as a general term. And we use those for sweetening. Because, as you know, we go unplugged. We don't color. We don't uh, uh, filter. We don't chill filter. We don't use enzymes. We don't do anything. So the whiskey's color comes from the wood. And then there's a sixth element, which is what we call exotic. And that's a small, that 5%. Um, and that is, is things like uh, weird uh, oaks, uh, like uh, Quercus humboldtus uh, from the Andes, which is quite high in eucalyptoids, uh, um, and one or two other white American oak varieties, uh, um, which, which, you know, just a little exotic. So each farm goes into the same proportion. Right. So, so as I said, you know, we could replicate each farm as a bottling if we choose mm. uh, or we can select out what bits we want and what bits we don't so so this is all about this is all about uh, um, not just making it difficult but the other way around it's giving us choices it's giving ned uh, um, the biggest cupboard of ingredients you've ever seen uh, uh, um, in a distillery now, you know, you know, cynics will say, ah, oh, but, you know, distilleries, you know, but they've got hundreds of bar you know, barrels. Uh, yeah, but it's the same whiskey that's in them. Uh, um, we're talking about 40 different versions of, as you know, of, of water for whiskey. Mm -hmm. Now, I suppose the big question is, why, why are we doing it? Well, because there is an ulterior motive. And the ulterior motive is, again, an influence from the wine world. Um, and it's, it, it, it's, funny enough, it, it, it's, it's um, uh, Krug. Remy, uh, do you know Krug, Krug Champagne? About 30 years ago, I remember, I remember being in the cellars in Reims mm. with Remy Krug. And he was making... Um, he, was, he had hundreds of sample bottles uh, um, and he was making the vintage uh, crew for that year. And so he had all the samples there. And, um, and I remember, you know, so, you know what, what, how do you do this? And he said, well, it's very, he said, it's very simple, Mark. He said, he said for, the, for vintage crew, it's God that decides on the quality he decides the rain and the sun and this and the other. It, it, he said, but for the grand cuvee, I'm God. <laughs> and I remember this because, yes, because he is selecting the different samples. He's nosing them, different vintages, different soils, uh, different varieties, you know, from the Chardonnay, from the Montagne de, de Blanc and Vertu and uh, uh, um, the Pinot Noir from, from, from Bouzy. And, you know, and he's assembling them to create the style of crew that he is looking for. So that means 
sometimes in the future there will be something like a Waterford distillery Correct. style. Cuvée. Yeah. There, there'll be a cuvee. Now, there, there's a Waterford distillery style already appearing. You know, we're not, we're not making it happen. It happens yeah. itself. Right. I mean, I mean, Ned, you know, one of the first things he ever said to me was, well, what, what are we looking for? And I said, well, we're not. It is what it is. Um, and we can show, I, I'll sh I can show you that graphically because it's quite, it's quite interesting. Uh, um, so, 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 no, the, the aim with these component single farm origins is to stack them together. Mm. Because if, if each one has its own flavor profile, which you've nosed in two, imagine what happens if you put one on another, on another, on another. You're creating mind fuckery. You're creating layers of, of fruit flavor that are going to be released in the glass. Mm. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. The single farms, the terroirs, are stepping stones to our uh, big vision, which is a cuvee, or put it another way, uh, in Bordeaux. Uh, what makes the great wines of Bordeaux so complex? Um, it's how they're made. Chateau Latour or Lafitte or Mouton, you know, they, they are made up of 50 or so little wines. Each one a different grape variety, ideally suited to its terroir around the estate. It's, it's cultivated separately. It's vinified, harvested separately, vinified separately, put into barrels separately. And then 18 months later, they are assembled and in varying proportions, put together, married, to create the Grand Vin. That's how they make this, this mind-numbing complexity of flavor. Each component wine with its own profile is adding. It's the sum of the parts being greater than the individual components. That's the game. And that's the target for me, is this profoundness of making a really compelling, profound whiskey. So these single farm origins are for interest. They are um, uh, components of what will be um, a compelling, the most profound whiskey I think it's possible to make. Hopefully it'll be one of the best, <laughs> uh, but it'll certainly be compelling. I can tell you, you know, it's going to give off layer after layer after layer of flavor. Um, so, 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 so that's the, the modus operandi of, of, of why we're doing this. Um, uh, uh, I mean, there is method, you know, to the madness uh, uh, um, you know, behind it. In fact, you know, uh, you asked me about, um, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, um, there you go. I don't know if you can see that. That, that, is, that is one terroir, okay? Okay. If you look around the edges, you'll yes. see there's a bit of green and a bit of blue. Those are differences attributable to different harvests. Right. Okay. I see so that. Yeah. You know, in one, you know, there's slightly fruitier in one mm -hmm. of this. Yeah. It's to hard another. to read, but I, I pepper, I can see well, the, uh, cereal malt. Yeah. You can see grainy. Yeah. But look at the shape overall, mm -hmm. the yellow shape. Yeah. Just keep that in your mind, the yellow shape, okay? Here's another one. Different right. shape. Completely different okay. shapes. Mm -hmm. Obvious difference. But it's still Waterford whiskey. It's still mm -hmm. still the same place, same way. But look, it's a different profile. Mm -hmm. it, it, if I can... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? And it changes slightly from year to year, as far as I can see here. Look, there's another one. Look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Harvest differences, same soil. Mm. All right. Right. Now, if we put this together, you get that. <laughs> That's Waterford whiskey. Fascinating. It is. 
Fascinating. Now that's just a part. We've got forty of them. Yeah, that's just a part. So that's part of the the the, the terroir study. Mm. But how do we get those graphs? Well, we use the latest uh, um, uh, mass spectron gas chromatography. Now, the, 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 the concept's been around for a long time. Yes, you can take spirit, you can analyze it, and it gives you that. You no, know, that's fine. That's that's nothing new. What's new is the olfactory part. You can now attribute, the sensitivity is there, you can attribute actual aromas at the time they're being given off. So it's quite complex, but you can marry both what you're seeing analytically mm. with what you're smelling. And in fact, we've discovered uh, in this process eight new unnamed flavor compounds. So it, it's it's absolutely riveting stuff. It's 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 fascinating. Now now the the thing is, you, you know, testing it, testing it in 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 in, in uh, 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 um, sample bottles or uh, in a laboratory, it's all very well um, to do it that way. The proof of the pudding is whether you notice it when it's when you're drinking. In other words, not really paying attention. And I didn't experience that till only about three weeks ago. Um, it had always been part of, you know, study, part of, you know. But I sat down with some farmers here on Isla who knew I'd got these first bottlings of Waterford and they were very interested to try them. And we sat there and we chatted away and we tried one and, yeah, yes, that's very interesting. And it tried another one. Well, that's very different. Wow, you know. Uh, um, and this was drinking. This was not tasting you know there's yeah. a big difference uh um, and the third one well it's different again you know and you just think this is great because i'm just letting it you know wash over me um and these guys are getting exactly what i thought they would i'm getting what i thought i hoped would, would, would come through you know i was a bit worried that you know in in, in a social environment if you weren't paying attention that you wouldn't notice it so much. But on the contrary, it stands out like a, you know, sore thumb. And then, of course, by the end, you go, well, okay, let's try a bit of each of them together. Like that graph. And it's even better, you know. And you go, well, that's it, man. That's it. That's the whole principle. It, the thumb that we had that evening um, was just you think well this is this is what whiskey is it's it is fun it's not an ordeal uh, um, we're not trying to sort of you know be pretentious about it I've I've explained to you why we're doing it and where, where we're going we're just really intrigued and we're so intrigued we think that you might be intrigued as well mm. you know this is not aimed at you know uh, um, every alcoholic or every corner shop. This is, you know, this whole concept is aimed at people who, um, uh, you know, are curious. They, you know, they want to know more. They want to understand why. Um, they, they want, they're, they're intrigued. Um, and, and we're just really pleased to share our intrigue with you. Um, this journey of discovery and it's not over. You know, we've we've hardly started. You know, you know these spirits that we've bottled up now, which have been so well received, sold out in Germany, in Belgium, in Holland, in the UK, in Ireland, within three hours. Um, the reception of those spirits, and they're for drinking. They're not. You know, they they are for drinking. Um, it, it is testament to the fact that people are. I think fed up with being steamrolled with, you know, drink this or sort of put hairs in your chest or drink this because, you know, uh, you know, and, 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 they, and they just want to know more. And we shouldn't be surprised because since you started with Brooklyn, we've been educating people, explaining, you know, what happens, how this happens. Despite what you know, the rest of the industry. You know, when we started Brooklady, you, you weren't even allowed to visit distilleries. You know, they wouldn't let you in uh, until we opened the doors and said, "Look, you know, come on in. There's nothing to hide here." Um, so, so, I th so I think it's a a, um, a big game-changing moment 
of of uh, for the whiskey uh, fan. Not all of them, because I know a lot of people would just be very, very happy carrying on. That's you know, that's you know, fine. That, 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 you know, there's no issue with that at all. There's some excellent, excellent whiskies out there. Get stuck in, no problem at all. But if you are at all curious to know, well, here's your chance. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, for for people that drink wine, are familiar with the concept of tawa, it's not scary. You know, it's understandable. You know, hey, you. Know, Here's an entry into uh, um, into a new world. If you're a, a, a whiskey fan that's been there since the beginning, you know, back in the 80s, or whatever, all those old whiskies have gone. All those pioneering uh, whiskies that were liberated um, in the 80s uh, from distilleries that have been shut down in the in, in the early 70s. I mean. You know, those were halcyon moments. Um, I remember it well. But they've all gone. Those stocks have all gone. Those innocent days have gone. They have. The the wood is recycled again and again and again and again. The barley's been standardized. Uh, um, I just think that there is disillusionment from those early pioneers who had it so cheap so old and so rare um and that's all gone now old equals outrageously expensive but the quality is you know really poor it's literally scraping the barrel um you got a 70s 80s period of pretty nondescript performance it's only sort of in more recent times that i think the 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 the, the farm distillers, the, the Calhomans, uh, 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 um, the Rase distilleries, the Ardnemer, who you know, small distillers who who perhaps saw what we did at Brookladdy and thought, well, hey, look, we, we can we can do something here. Um, that's sort of changing, you know, expectations. And of course, those whiskies are getting older and older. Um, you know. The whiskies that we have pulled now are, are, are barely four years of age, but you'd think there were 10. It's surged, you know, Valentin reviewed recently. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the beginning. Imagine what they're going to be like when they're six or eight or 10. I mean, th- that's what I, I just, you know, we've given birth to this, this, this monster of complexity of flavor and stuff uh, um, and, and, and opportunities. Um, and it's only going to get older, you know. And, and of course, one of the things we we made sure we did uh, when we set up Waterford was correcting mistakes um, I made at Brookladdy. You know, we never distilled enough the, the financial model for Brookladdy at the beginning, so we were always dipping in to our first spirit. So it never got old because we were using it quicker than we could, you know. Uh, uh, sure. um, it, it, so, 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 you know, with Waterford, we made sure we've distilled you know, a million litres, a million litres, or as near as damn it, each year. So when we do Bano Island, first edition, 1.1, and it sells out in a nanosecond, well, we can revisit it. We can have Bano Island 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. And it could be five, six months older age between them. Hmm. We may, you know, we, we may, and that's from the same distillation, yeah. the same harvest. So we can keep revisiting the same harvest. And we can go to another harvest. Well, you know, so that would be a 2.1, 2.2. 2. No, so, so, so the permutations are, are, are riveting, riveting. That will be a fun journey. And we're very much looking forward to that. So I think that's a very nice end to a very nice interview. Uh, Thank you very much for talking to us. I hope I haven't bored you too much. No. I hope I haven't bored you too much. Not at all. Not at all. It was most interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And it was a pleasure for us. Okay. And you too. Frost.